Thank you very much, and Shavua uh, Tov to everybody. Uh, I thank you for coming. I thank uh, the Golden Hirschers for, for hosting this event, and of course I thank uh, my very good friend, Rebo Kelman. Uh, as mentioned, I published this article in Chakira, which is a bi-annual journal that goes uh, in Flatbush, a very interesting journal that I am uh, subscribed to for several years. And most articles are in English, but they always have one or two in Hebrew at the end, and I published uh, my article in Hebrew in that journal. I think from there, uh, what they sent out, I think maybe 50 people saw the article. I definitely don't think anybody read it. It's a very lengthy article, but part of the whole article. Twice. <laughs> <laughs> I take my hat that I don't have all. Uh, but I assume about 50 people saw it through the journal, and Rebo Kelman is probably responsible for another 500 at least. Uh, he's been promoted. Uh, uh, we speak, uh, correspond daily, and this is the first time in my life that I've ever seen him. Uh, so it's Kula Lishmo, Lishem Shomayim, as Talmidim of Baron Soloveitchik, and uh, uh, he thinks that it is time that more is said about both Rebaran and his father and other parts of the family. Um, so uh, I need two hagdamot uh, or caveats or apologies to begin with. Uh, first of all, Ramoshe Soloveitchik has mentioned to talk about Ramoshe Soloveitchik should really be to talk about his Torah. From everything I've read, and I've read quite a, uh, a bit about him, his entire life was learning Torah and teaching Torah. Gemara, Rambam, Briske Derech, and Shita, and that's, that's how he saw his life. And, and to talk about Ramaj without talking about his, his Torah is, uh, is missing. But Baruch Hashem, uh, as mentioned, he has had uh, big Talmidei Chachomim children, and he has big Talmidei Chachomim grandchildren and great-grandchildren <coughs> who are, Baruch Hashem, spreading a lot of his Torah. A lot of them have been published in recent years, both on their own, and they're embedded all over his, uh, his sons and grandchildren and many other parts of the Rish dynasty's uh, Divrei Torah. It's actually, once somebody should make, do a, a scholarly article, it's, it would take years to really discern which of the Divrei Torah or Brisk are his fathers, which are his, which are his brothers, which are his sons. There's a big mix-up in Mishmash, who is the originator and who is the, uh, the one who, this part and that part, but uh, it's definitely embedded in Baruch Hashem, it's being learned. But um, I was uh, brought to the story. Uh, he has a very unique uh, life story, I believe, uh, and a very unique uh, outlook on certain public issues, which I think are still relevant uh, to our day, and that is part of the reason I got into this article. So, after saying this is not the main thing about his life, uh, uh, it's still what I wanted to say about it. The second thing is, certain when talking about a life and challenges and that he goes through, at some point we may try to analyze him or think what he thought or felt, and that is a very difficult thing to do about anybody. It's definitely difficult to do about uh, a great Talmud Chochem who is mainly guided by what he believes is the Aloha and Ashkafa, but also for him personally is difficult because he is a person like the rest of his family before him, not, definite, not necessarily after him, they don't talk about emotions. And there's a famous story that I assume many of you know about how Rav Soloveitchik describes um, his separation from his father, leaving to go to study in, uh, in, in Berlin, and he's separating from his father. He's not going to see him definitely for years, and uh, the connection between those son and father is, is unbelievable to what Rav Soloveitchik, Rav Yosef Ber Soloveitchik thought about his father and what his father thought about him. At some point, Rav Moshe Soloveitchik can say almost his main action was to try to promote his son, who he believed was the Dig Dolador and should be the the manhig of, uh, of Kal Israel, and with that unbelievable connection, he describes separating for him and not a hug, not a kiss, no, no bodily warmth. And he's describing that's how it is. It's not that he didn't love him. It's a different way of, of showing or, or, or uh, than we are used to today. So to try to talk about what Ramayusha Soloveitchik felt uh, is pure speculation. I am sure I will over that love at some point uh, during this evening. Um, Okay, if uh, um, I'll go to this, this article, Rabbi life is actually, you can split it into three separate uh, parts, his, his, his youth and his first, uh, his marriage and his first Rabbonus, 
a decade that he spent in Poland, which is the main part of my article, and uh, his last decade of his life in the United States. Now, since there are some people who've read the entire article, and some of them <laughs> have not at all, I will try to do a little bit about, around what is done in the article, and a little bit which is, and, and show it in a different light, I hope, uh, to ha keep everybody happy. So, uh, Ramosh Soloveitchik is born, was born to his father in 1879. Uh, his father, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, uh, no need to t tell anybody here about Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, the, the greatest mind considered in Oilam Yeshivas in, in the last few hundred years and who's totally turned, uh, changed the way uh, people learn till today uh, in the Briska Derech. Uh, he himself was a Rosh Yeshiva in... Uh, uh, even though it was only when he was very young and only actually for about a little bit more than a decade, but that influence of that decade that he taught in Volozhin has fell till today. And then he was a rabbi in Brisk. He's the son of the Beit Alevi, Rabbi Yosheh Bersolovechik, a big Talmud Chochum, a, a Rosh Hashiva in Volozhin and a rabbi in Brisk. And he was married to the daughter of Rabbi Foyle Shapira, also a Rosh Hashiva in Volozhin, the son-in-law of the Nitziv. So if we stop again, Ramosh Soloveitchik is the grandson of the Beis HaLevi, he's the grandson of Rufoil, Shapira, and the Nitzim of Volozhin, the Rosh Hashivas of Volozhin. He's the son of Reb Chaim Soloveitchik. Can't get, any, can't get any better than that. This is, uh, I don't want to use the word, the Soloveitchiks are the Kennedys of, uh, of the Torah <laughs> world. It was, uh, that's using it the wrong way around. Right? Uh, I had a ram in, in Hebron, a big time with Chochem, Baron Yafin, uh, who put out the Ritva and, and the Dori and Yevomis, he always used to say, people say time is, time is money. You want to show how important time is, they say time is money. He says, that's a terrible saying. It should be the other way around. You're valuing things by how much money it's worth. You're saying time is worth money. It's actually, it's exactly the opposite. Money is time. Time is the most important thing. And you should value by how much money you can save, how much time you can save by the money. That's the value. So I don't want to say that, but definitely anything related to the Soloveitchik is... Uh, this is the family, the, the, the royal family of uh, the yeshiva world. And Ramosha is born into this family. Uh, but as mentioned before, if I jump to the end, he is today a bit overshadowed by his father, by his brother, his younger brother, Yitzchok Zev, the Gris, the Brisker Rov, who was a Rov here in Yushalayim, after Brisk was here in Yushalayim, and his son and son's uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik. But he and himself... Uh, it's definitely worth speaking about, and that's what I try to do in the article and try to do here. So he's born to this very illustrious family. He's a Talmud of his father. That is what he does. He's a Talmud Muvhak of his father, and his Iker Torosa and his main Torosa is learning from his father. Again, there's a very touching letter that uh, Rabbi Yosef Soloveitchik uh, from uh, the Old City, Rabbaran's son, published uh, uh, a few years ago, a letter that uh, Ramosha Soloveitchik writes to the Chofetz Chaim son-in-law after Reb Chaim's, uh, pa his father uh, passed away. Uh, and he, first of all, in the middle there, there's this description of a brisk of him. him he, he didn't believe it. He read it. The, he wasn't at the Leviathan. His father died in Varsha uh, during the end of World War I, and he wasn't there. And he didn't believe the news that he was hearing in newspapers. They're all liars, those news. It can't be such a terrible thing. And he said he went to find out, and he traveled until in Smolensk he found some true, real people, Aidy, who told him that this horrible news is is actually true. And he, he's describing this unbelievable break and telling him, telling him, Mele, if it was a son and a father, maybe I could be Kabul Tanchumim on such a tragedy. But he's not just my father, he's, he's everything. He's my entire knowledge, he's my entire Torah, is from him. Anything I want to discuss, everything I learn, anything I, I, I want to ask him and hear what he says about it, what he has to add, does he accept it, does he not? It's not just me, he says, it's all, I'm Israel, it's, it's, it's all broken, there's nothing left. It's, it's a, a very, very touchy letter that he writes about the terrible feeling of loss that he has after his fa father's passing away. Mm -hmm. So that's his, his Torah, and for the rest of his life, he's learning exactly on that way. He's a big, uh, he has tremendous, uh, uh, he has a lot what to add to it, and a lot of chidushim, but they're all based on that, that way of it that he got from his father. Um, he marries, uh, um, again, I apologize for using the word daughter every time. I already got it from my cousin that I don't mention them by name, but if you want to be true to history, those shidduchim at the time were made based on who the father is. And uh, 
Uh, she was, uh, he, he was, uh, he married uh, the daughter of Rebella Prusiner, uh, Rebella Feinstein, the rabbi of Prusiner, big Talmud Chochem. Um, but here is an aside. Uh, his daughter, uh, Moshe's daughter, uh, Rebbe Tzin Meiselin, uh, published a book about her memoirs, uh, you know, My Heritage, and she mm-hmm. describes a lot about her mother and her father and a lot about that marriage. And I know that a lot of people in the family were very not satisfied with the book that she published or brought out in the open all kinds of things that they thought should be kept in at home and there's no reason to tell everybody about conflicts in the marriage and so on. Um, so I won't, of course, I, wherever it was relative, I, I, I used the book, but I, I, again, don't want to analyze the relationship between him and his wife because I don't know anything about it. I just will say that there are people on the other side of the spectrum who, once in a while, when you discuss Ramosha, they say, well, that is the influence of his wife's family. It's not only his wife, but her brothers and sisters were definitely more worldly, were more interested in secular knowledge, more interested in what's in the tremendous ideological movements that they were at the time. Uh, I don't really believe it had that much of an impact on him. It's true that he sat there, and after his marriage, he sat and learned there for many years. I don't think he took it in. I think he, he really remained with what he came from, from his father mm-hmm. and his ideology and his belief. I don't think he was that much influenced from uh, his wife's family, even if they had a little bit different uh, opinions. But this is speculation. Uh, I don't think, and she herself writes, that he, he ever, personally, Ramosh ever, uh, gave value to secular studies or secular knowledge, even though, as we'll see in a moment, taught much of his life in institutions which had secular studies. I don't think he personally valued them, and I, his, his daughter herself says that he, he did not value them uh, personally. Uh, in the aspect of his son, Rabbi Shaber, and his thought about him, I'll, I'll say something in a moment. So after he marries, he sits there at his father-in-law, and he learns, he eats kest. He's uh, being paid, and he learns Torah there. And again, there's a terrific description of his son, Rabbi Shaber, one of his books describing how he grew up, Rabbi Shaber, in his father's house there in Prujin. He grew up with the Rambam, describing the shirim, uh, his classes that his father uh, gives to a group of Talmudim, and every time it's learning in Gemara, learning Rashi Tosfat, and he says, okay, let's see what the Rambam says, opens up the Rambam, and then <coughs> the Rambam's shver, it doesn't work out, it doesn't fit the Gemara, and the Ravid has Asoga, and things look terrible, and Rabbi Shaber, the little boy, gets all nervous, what's going to be with the Rambam? <laughs> And he runs to his mother, the Rambam Shver, and then they work at it together. And you know, like Reb Chaim himself, his father, his shir in Voloshin, wasn't an organized and structured shir. <laughs> the exact opposite of what anybody heard of Yosh Shaber in, in, in YU, it wasn't planned. He came, he opened the Gemara, he asked a question, he had a thought, he walked back, he had a new idea, and from all this Balagan, at some point, came out a brilliant structured shir. So that's how Reb Chaim used to give his shir in Voloshin. So Reb Chaim, probably somewhere along the middle line, so he grew up with his feeling, that's how he grew up, and then, oh, at the end, Chaim is a- the, the Rambam is answered, is not answered, that was his day, that was his life, that's how it looked over there. Uh, we get to the point where Moshe is about 30 years old, uh, and uh, the cast is over, and you need a parnosa, you need a job. So his father, Reb Chaim, as is used in the Brisk family to an extreme, does everything to arrange a stelle, a job for the son. Uh, so he starts, the, his first uh, position that he got was in a town called Rasein. It's a big town, important Jewish community. And as Rabbi Kamenetsky, Byakov Kamenetsky, describes beautifully in a tape, which is brought down by his son in his book, Erev uh, Nothing, <laughs> describes what went on there. Uh, the rub of the town was... Uh, of Alexander Moshe Lapidus. He was a rabbi of the town, a big time of He was a rabbi of the town for about 45 years. <coughs> and towards his old age, he started to be a little bit senile. Now, rabbis are never turned out of their position. So what did they do? They had some nephew of his who was a dayan, and they put him in the hall in the entrance to the house of the rabbi. He'd sit there, and when the people came to ask the questions, he'd pask him for the chicken and for the so on. He had this kind of motz dying there was, uh, was in the town. When Rabbi Alexander Moshe died and opened up this job of the rabbi of Rasein, an important rabbinic position, any rabbi who came to the town had this dying Motz who was already in there, 
not happy about anybody coming from the outside. Probably the people in the town didn't uh, value enough this dying to turn him to the rabbi of the town, but it was enough to cause trouble to anybody coming from outside, and, and the position left open for a few years. Until Reb Chaim decided this is a terrific position for his son, Reb Moshe. The problem was that the people in the town had the same opposition. Hussein is an important Choshev Vashtela. We're not going to give it to a 30-year-old guy. This is a big town. Uh, so Reb Chaim brought to bear his entire force, sent there his Talmidim, and to tell everybody, you have to uh, appoint my son there. And there's a lot of uh, funny stories about that. Among them, the, the Rosh Hakol there was a big Talmud Chacha, an interesting person. And uh, at one point, uh, one of the stories goes that they come and tell him that he should appoint him. And he says, why? What's so unique about this Reb Moshe? Uh, one of the stories that Reb Bochaber was discussing with him, he said, well, I asked Reb Chaim, and Reb Chaim said about his son, Reb Moshe, he knows how to answer a, a, a difficult Rambam. His son is excellent at that. So the Rosh HaKol told him, lo bezogen, okay, why does he have to sit in Rasein and answer the Rambam? Why can't he sit in Brisk and answer the Rambam? <laughs> that was a good way. Uh, <laughs> Another Rosh Hakol, they said there, said, you know, Loma Zogi, if you'd say Reb Chaim himself wants to come be in the room, we're willing to consider it on the board. But his son, <laughs> we're not up to that stage. But, of course, uh, with his power, he managed to get him approved. And afterwards, probably got the rest of the community also along to be happy with his uh, nomination. Uh, and he opened there a kind of uh, small kibbutz of Talmidim. He got uh, the altar from uh, uh, Slobodka, the Rosh Hashiva in Slobodka, to send a group of Talmudim to hear Shir there uh, from Ramosha. There probably was some kind of deal going on there that's saying, if you learn half a year by Ramosha, we'll get you to learn by Reb Chaim. Uh, they had some deal there also. And he had a group of Talmudim that he taught there. I saw an ad, very odd story in the newspaper that I didn't get to the end of it. I mean, for this article, uh, today it's very easy. What people used to work very... Uh, used to be hard and you had to sit in universities for hours today. For example, all the newspapers from that uh, decade are online in the Hebrew University. Uh, and I have went through years of Yiddish articles that I don't really know how to read Yiddish, I'm breaking my teeth and trying to find something mentioned about the family or the town. Uh, but it's much easier than it used to be. So there's, at some point there's an ad that Ramosha himself prints in the newspaper saying, that people are saying that there is no yeshiva and there's some people going around collecting money for his yeshiva. And he says, it's unbelievable, these liars are making up these stories about him. There's a yeshiva, there's 25 students there, and these are their names, and etc. He had to, somebody was working against his yeshiva. I don't exactly know the full understanding of it. But after three years, he leaves that yeshiva, uh, leaves that town, and moves to a different job to be the rabbi of Chaslovich. And Chaslovich, the rabbi before, and that was his brother in law. And after that one, his brother in law got promoted to Novardok, he moved to that town. Probably some of that unrest at the beginning was there that made him leave, because it's not a bigger town, Chaslovich, than Rasei. But he moved to Chaslovich, again, an important rabbinic position, and was there a row for a few years. So until now, everything is normal. Son of Reb Chaim knows how to learn. <coughs> Big Talmud Chochem has some shiuri, got some uh, important rabbinical position, and it's all online to continue terrifically, and I would never stand here today and give you a speech about him. Something changed there along the way. World War I broke out. Uh, the communists came to power. And uh, Chaslovich is in the USSR, as uh, I'm close to the border, but it's on the other side. It's under communist control, and conditions deteriorate, both physically, both on what there's to eat and uh, business, and definitely on religious matters. Uh, religion is under assault by the communists, and things deteriorate greatly until at some point he gives up and he leaves the town towards the end of World War I. And he goes and travels to his uh, grandfather, Rebbe Foyle Shapir, the Rosh Hashiva of Volozhin, uh, and he gets to meet him. As we said, he did not get to meet his father. His father traveled at the end of the war to Poland and died in Warsaw, and he wasn't there. So his father died, he's left his town, and then at the end of the war comes this idea to reopen the Volozhin Yeshiva. Volozhin, as I assume many of you know, the yeshiva, was closed down in 1892 between, because of an entire, it's a whole dispute in itself why it was closed down. I won't, not as clear as people tried to make it. 
about the involvement of the Soviet government and how much uh, secular studies they'll be there. It, it's more complicated than that, but it was closed down in 1892. But a few years later, it was opened again by the son-in-law of Nzib, by Rafael Shapir, by the grandfather of Moshe, but it never was the Voloshin that it was beforehand. So that yeshiva existed, and then it closed down again for World War I, and Rafael Shapir wasn't there anymore. And there was an idea to reopen the yeshiva. So Rafael Shapir, his grandfather, told them that he will get the position as the Rosh Yeshiva in this new yeshiva that they will open of Volozhin. There will be two Rosh Yeshivas. One is the son of Rabbi Foyal, Yaakov Shapir, and the second will be his grandson, Ramosha. It's not just two grandchildren of him. It's rebuilding the original Volozhin because we have the, the Nitziv's line and Shapir line, which will be his son, and Ramosha is replacing his father, Reb Chaim, who was a Ram in Volozhin. And with that very unique way of learning, they'll bring the two of them together, they had a special meeting of all the grandchildren on the yard side of Reb Chaim Volozhin there in Volozhin. Uh, Volozhin was on the other side. It was uh, right over the border. It was not in uh, communist Russia. It was in Poland. And, and that sounded like a fantastic solution to teach Torah in Volozhin. What can be better? Like his father. It did not happen. It did not materialize. Again, there's a lot of speculation exactly why. But in the bottom line, he was denied that position. Uh, his daughter describes at some point very great argument that he has with his brother, his younger brother, the Brisk Yerov, about why isn't his younger brother fighting enough for him for the yeshiva. But uh, I, don't know, she, I don't think she knew that from first hand, so I don't know exactly what the reasons were, but he didn't get the job. So his grandfather died, he didn't get the job, he crossed the border over to Poland, and he has nothing there. He went to his father-in-law, Rebele Pruzhner, and this man who was a rov of a town, the town doesn't exist anymore. His father, who is his entire life, is dead. His grandfather is dead. The yeshiva of Volozhin, where he thought he'd get a job, he doesn't have anything. He's left without anything. After going through very difficult times, he gets a job in a very small town called Antipol, but he never really takes it up. And then comes this idea, he's given a position to be the Rosh Yeshiva of a rabbinic seminary of the Mizrahi in Warsaw, the Tachkemoni. The general administration there is under a very famous... Give us a year. Yeah. Now, 1921. Uh, Professor Balaban, considered the greatest historian of Polish Jewry, he's the head of the secular studies, and Ramosha Soloveitchik will be the head of the Bes Medrash. And he takes his job. <coughs> and this is, of course, a major turning point. The son of Rabbi Brisker, who definitely is opposed to Zionism, is opposed vehemently to the Mizrahi, definitely opposed to any mixing up of secular studies with Aloha, his son, goes and becomes the Rosh Yeshiva in this rabbinic seminary, Tachimoni in Warsaw. This is the turning point of his life. Uh, I don't know if you know about the Haredi community, community, but there's no going back. Okay, and in three years they open up some shtela and some yeshiva and they say, hey, we hear Ramosh Yeshiva, he gives an unbelievable shir, he's never going to get that job after he was in Tachimoni, they're not going to take it. He has set his line somewhere else. Now, if I'll take a step back, why is the story of Ramosh and Soloveitchik so interesting? There are many children who do not follow their parents' footsteps exactly. Uh, the Kanoi bin Yerushalayim, the Maril Diskin, and his son Rabbi Tzchok uh, Diskin, their only living grandson is a girl who lives in Australia. Wow. It happens in every, every family. Nothing special about it. I mean, they're special, each one's a story, but it's not unique. What's unique about this story is that Ramosh Soloveitchik from this point and on until the rest of his life never, ever thinks for a moment that he's leaving even a tiny inch doing anything different than what his father taught him. He is following his father's derech, but he's going somewhere else. He's admiring his father. His father is the only Torah there is in the world. And yet he's going in a path where it seems evident that if his father was alive, he'd go crazy. Uh, and... There are all kinds of uh, stories about uh, both Reb Chaim Moiser and, and the Chofetz Chaim being uh, displeased by this move of Reb Moiser. And for, definitely for the Mizrahi, it's a big uh, success. We got a, a top caliber rabbi to be here, the rabbi in, in, in our seminary. Uh, all this is actually a setup to what happens at this time. Reb Moiser is now in Poland. He has this job. He's connected more to the Mizrahi. Uh, and he lives in an area where he doesn't really appreciate 
the rabbinic structure that there's there. Many, chas- many Hasidim, and if not Hasidim, the way of learning is totally different than what Volozhin, who definitely brisk, and his father is. And then we jump two years forward, and we're in 1923. And 1923 has the first uh, Aguda convention in history. The Knesia Agdola in Vienna, 1923. Right before that, there's the general Zionist uh, convention, which meets much more often. And the Mizrahi has a convention right before that. It all happens within three months. There's a Mizrahi convention, the Zionist convention, and Aguda's first Knesia Agdola. So the papers are full. It's, it's impossible to read at the time. The people write at length with tremendous ideology. And it goes on and on and on and on. But it's, it's all ideological discussions, heated discussions about what the world should be in all the newspapers. Um, and then Ramoisha goes and participates in the Mizrahi convention. They have a rabbinic convention on the side of the convention. There's 75 rabbis there, some of them very, very important rabbonim. Um, and he sits there at a meeting uh, led uh, by the uh, Rabbi Trunk, uh, uh, Big Talmud Chochem in itself, the Marcheshet, uh, Rabbi Agis, a friend of Rabbi Chaim Moriz, sits there, and other very important Rabbonim. And one of the sessions is discuss what is our relationship to Agudas Yisrael. Some are very militant, some say we should try and get along with them. And then Ramoisha speaks. And Ramoisha speaks, and he says, I, I'm not part of here, I'm not here for the party in Israel. I'm not a into politics. I just came here to talk about one issue that bothers me, and that is Moetzis Doilater. I've been reading the newspapers of Agudas Yisrael, and I've come to the understanding that the entire purpose of Agudas Yisrael with this convention is to set up a Moetzis Doilater. And I've come to the understanding that the entire purpose of Moetzis Doilater is to set up a body which is the ruler, the one to determine what is Aloha, what is Ashkofa, what is the Adut for the world. And I think that is, he uses we have a few letters, different words about it, an absurdity, and definitely not true to halacha, and a terrible thing. And we should all say a mechoy against this thing. There is no such thing as having some group who nominate themselves, who are totally political. He always repeats this thing that there's a political connection here. That's not how you determine rabbis in Yadut. It's not if you're related to a party, and it's not determined by the party functionaries who the G'dayli Mar to this, determine what halacha is. So, after this, and of course the paper publishes this, there's an uproar. Uh, good, I mean, this is not just anybody. Reb Chaim's son, Reb Moshe, is attacking them so like that. So they start attacking him back. Of course, they use the fact that he's teaching in the Tachkemoni, and they start attacking the Tachkemoni, and, and saying people, they don't want to let fill in at all that this guy is teaching there, and he's making Rabbonim, and he's telling us about who's making Rabbonim, and so on. So, Reb Moshe answered that. But... <coughs> The story changes, where at some point they say, we don't understand after everything that Moshe said, this is Agudah Sisro, we're, at the, we're in a war zone now, this is 1920s. Uh, religious Judaism is on a downturn. People are moving away from religion all the time. They're going to all these communist movements and Zionists and so on. We're in a battleground. So we're setting up this Agudah, and Moshe is trying to block it. The one thing that bothers you is not the thousands of people becoming not religious, it's bothering you that there's a Moshe and And... Lastly, your father was the one who set up Agudat Israel, and now you're working against what your father did. This Ramosha, of course, got him very upset. And he publishes in the newspaper, the thing amazing about it is he publishes this in the, in the, in the general newspaper. I don't know exactly how to describe it, if it's Haaretz, Yediot, or Makori Shon, but it's definitely <laughs> not Yated Neeman. Yes, it's the general population newspaper where hundreds of thousands of people are reading. He's even published in two different, in the Moment and the Hind which are read by the general population of Warsaw and Lodge by tens of thousands of people, and he writes an article there attacking the Agudah Yisrael and the Moetz and the And there he says, among others, what you say, my father was an Agudah Yisrael, that's an absolute lie. My father was against Agudah Yisrael. We'll take a breather. Agudah Yisrael had three main steps. They were discussing it for many years, but its formation is considered the time it was decided was in 1909 in a house in a resort town in Germany called Bad Homburg. Now, when I sent the article in, every time I wrote about Hamburg, the guy changed it to Hamburg. He erased the vav. But what can I do? It's a separate town. This Hamburg is a huge city in the port in the north. And this is a small resort town, Bad Hamburg, where it happens to be that my great uncle was the rabbi. And the rabbi came there unreserved. And there there was Yitzchak Isaac Alevi, the guy who wrote the Rotary Shonim, a big Tamit Chochum. 
It's a story that's a lecture all on itself. I won't go into that. And he used to spend months there. And they together would discuss this issue. And at some point they had this meeting in 1909 where Reb Chaim was there, Reb Chaim Moise was there, the Ger Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, some Ger- German rabbis. And there they decided about forming Agudas Israel. So Reb Chaim was there. Then we have in 1912, three years later, there's a meeting, uh, convention in Katowice. There there's a large convention already of saying Opa Gudad Israel, and Reb Chaim was at that convention also. They were going to set up a Knesset Agdoilo. They tried to arrange it before World War II, but World, uh, World War I, the World War I broke out and it got stalled, so only in 1923 it happened. So everybody agrees that Reb Chaim was involved there at the beginning. The question is what happens afterwards. Reb says that after coming back from Katowice, his father said, these are good guys, they cheated me. And I should, if I had Koyach, I'd go out against them. I should attack them like I attacked the other parties. Uh, and he talked against them. And this Reb Moshe publishes uh, in the newspaper. That everybody should know that Reb Chaim was against it. So this, of course, uh, more than Reb Moshe's tainis, this is much more important for the Aguda. The main, they have the Chofetz Chaim and Reb Chaim. That's who the, they're saying is supporter of Aguda Israel. And his son says that he was against it. This is a big problem. So Reb Chaim Moiser has to publish a newspaper article, again, in the Aguda article this time, to say that it's not true. And Reb Chaim was for the Aguda. But there is this problem that he wasn't there. So Reb Chaim Moiser admits that at some point he got cold a bit to Aguda, but he says that was a technical issue. I won't discuss the entire issue, just, just to mention what it was. Again, Reb Chaim, uh, like all briskers, was nervous about what bad things could happen. Uh, and he was very nervous about setting up this central organization and this Aguda committee, especially that it was led by a lot of German rabbis that were definitely <coughs> foreign to him. Um, as uh, Yosef, uh, Solove- uh, as his, uh, uh, the Rav Soloveitchik uh, describes in one of his uh, conversations, he says, this whole convention seemed absolutely foreign to Reb Chaim. Sitting there and there's a motion and I'm voting for and I'm voting against and now I'm getting the floor and the chairman goes. It looked to Reb Chaim, it looked ridiculous, this uh, <coughs> kind of convention things to him. He wasn't used to it. But on the bottom line, he wrote down uh, what he thought should be the Articles of Association of Aguda with 18 points, which will make sure that Aguda will never cause problems for, for, for religion. It's usually called since then the Yud Dover. There's a Mishnah with the Yud Dover, so they call this the Yud Dover. Yes. So he came to the convention, and they promised him, you'll come to the convention, we'll make this the Article Association. And it never happened. At the end, Rosenheim, who was the leader, signed it because he got very nervous, signed it personally, gave it to him, but it was never published. It was never officially accepted by the organs of Agudas Israel. And Reb said, uh, they lied to me. And he got very upset, and then the Lubavitcher was also against They were working already together. And you see in the letters of Reb Chaim Moiseh how he's trying to, how's he going to take care of this problem that he has with Reb Chaim, who's the main center person, but he's getting very nervous and he, he can't really accept his, uh, his rules. Uh, again, if I'll jump to Reb Soloveitchik in his conversation, he says, Reb Chaim never meant that they should accept him. If you accepted those 18 <coughs> rules, Aguda would never be able to exist. They would turn it into a, a dead body. It, it couldn't act. Uh, he was going to strangle it. So they were in a conflict, and they tried to keep him in and keep him out and try to get wording, and there was negotiation for two years there, and it never happened. So again, if we jump to there, and Reb Chaim Moises says, Reb Chaim was for Aguda, he was there right at the beginning, and he's all for it, and he had some technical problem about how you mentioned the thing. And Reb Moises says, it's a lie. He was absolutely against, and once he, after that, he was vehemently against, and he told me personally, he wrote me a letter or even, and told me that he would go out against it. And it said, Anything that the general public comes together, you have to be afraid of. He trusts, Reb Chaim says, even if I'm now, you're going to put me in more, it's a Torah, I'm now there. In 20 years, who's going to be there? I don't trust any central authority in Judaism. I trust the local rabbi, the local kehillah, they'll be okay. But if you have some central thing, only bad things will come out of it. Uh, so I discuss, discuss at length the history there and who's closer to the story. It's, it's, both of them using the same story to set up different narratives. Uh, the, they censored it that I originally said that you know, closer to the, to the truth is the way Ramosha is describing it. Uh, if you can use that word, uh, his father definitely turned away. And that, that, that's how he was. There's a letter that Rabbi Moshe at some point writes in 1913, look, 
will never get Reb Chaim to agree. He's, that's how he is. He's, he's nervous about things. We just, uh, we'll continue with our work. We can't wait for him. Uh, okay, that's, how, that's how he does. Okay, so this set up, the first set, that he had this battle with Agudah Sishro. But now, again, speculation, if I'll fill in the holes, in Poland, I think, came a situation that people thought, look, if we have to fight with Rabonim or some organized rabbinic thing, if they're going to attack us, who can we go to? Rabbi Soloveitchik is a terrific so- solution. Since you have this big Talmud Chochem, who is not afraid to say what he believes is the truth, no matter who's against him. So if we're in trouble, he's somebody we can turn to. And then we have a few cases here where newspaper, been sta- newspaper uh, um, correspondents start going to Rabbi Moshe and asking him what he thinks about some public affairs. And it usually starts out the same way. He usually says, I'm not interfering. I don't know anything about it. And then the guy says, okay, so not about this, but in general, what do you think about Rabboni Zeh? <laughs> and at the end he says, so we have something benign, totally like uh, machine mats, as I mentioned there, one of the things which is very interesting in itself, where the Rabboni of Russia put out tremendously suring about machine mats. I said, it's, it's also funny, you see there in the newspaper, on, on the same page, the front page you have, Half the page is a Nusach Moidoy, Azor Hamura against Yushin Matzis, and the second half is Manishevitz advertisement <laughs> for Yushin Matzis on the same page. The, the newspaper guy, whoever pays, they'll put up the ad together. But they had a whole campaign against these Yushin Matzis, and then the correspondent went to ask him, I guess Manishevitz paid him, and uh, Ramosha said, What's wrong with Yushin Matzis? <laughs> so he said, uh, The guy tries to pull me. He says, he says I don't, In Russia, I don't interfere again with Rabbinica is there, but if, if you ask me what the pure aloha is, of course, Yushin Matzis are fine. And uh, everybody understands that the main thing in uh, Matzis is Vos Gichel, what's faster is better. Of course, Yushin Matzis are better. Uh, the correspondent there, he says, The guy, Rabbi, came to my father, I remember, and he tried to pay, he mentions, uh, like, Brisk, you know, what date it was that he asked his father, and which Rabbi spoke to him, and everything, and he told my father, tried to persuade him against machine matzis. My father told him, Reb Chaim said, Well, nothing wrong with machine matzis. So finally, the guy says to him, Look, maybe there's nothing wrong, but still, Minega Mokum in Varsha is not to. So, what's just the Minega Mokum is only when you have some Hidra and Aloha. Since it's not any Hidra and Aloha, it means nothing what the Rabboni and Varsha say. So, they, <laughs> so Ramosh Kaha passed away the entire uh, Warsaw Rabbin at Kaha Samem Klub. Uh, and uh, he got into trouble with him. So, uh, and that happened again. I, there was another issue, a story which I won't discuss, which I mentioned in the article about this unbelievable dispute of 20 years uh, dispute in Radum about the Machlokas uh, of the Rabbonis there. And I actually uh, did not find the article which, uh, Ramo- where the newspaper correspondent uh, dis- discusses with Ramoisha. I just found all the people attacking what Ramoisha said there. So I mentioned it like that, and Baruch Hashem, after I wrote my article, there's a guy, I don't know, again, I know him through uh, Rebor uh, Sassoon, his name is. He wrote an 18... 18- uh, what, what's his first name? Jacob, Jacob Sassoon. He wrote an 18-page uh, article to Hakira now as a response, which I assume will be published in the ne- 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 next Hakira. But uh, the most important thing for me is that he found that article. It was not, doesn't appear here in Israel. It doesn't appear in the National Library, but he found it in the, the Evo archives in, in the United States. And he has a whole pill pool there based on what he saw that Rabbi told a, a newspaper. But it's the same story. He, got, he said, I don't interfere, I don't know anything about the Rabbonus, I don't know the rabbi, I don't know anything. And then he said, but if you ask me that look, what the uh, uh, rabbi must say is, is incorrect. And then I'll go to the uh, final uh, dispute, and that is uh, in Tomoshov. There again, it's a lot of uh, mix-up. There's two Tomoshovs in Poland, like many other names of towns. There's Tomoshov Mazowiec, the one I'm talking about, and there's Tomoshov Lublin in the area of Lublin. Uh, a lot of mix up about that. In Tomasho, there was again a machloikis. The rabbi died. And in Poland, you had either two machloikis. Every town had a machloikis about Rabbonus. It was two possibilities. Either Aguda against Mizrahi or Gur against Alexander. He was more or less mixed up. You had both of them going together. And the second kind of machloikis you had in Poland, if not with Rabbonus, it was with the shoichti. So here you had also the shoichti. You had all the classic ingredients mixed up well in Tomasho. So the son of the Sochot Rebbe, the Shem Ishmuel, uh, Reb David uh, was the, um, the Hasidim were pushing him, and there was a Rav uh, brought uh, that uh, Mizrahi was pushing. Big Talmud Chochem. He was the later on the president of the Mizrahi in uh, Poland. He was a rabbi in Maria, New York, also uh, in the war. So it was a 
bitter battle. And then in the meantime, you also had a battle with the Shoich team. What was the battle with the Shoich team? The Polish government at some point decided to organize the Jewish communities. And in order that the Jewish communities could have money to work, they said that we'll change now the entire business of Shechita. Instead of the store owner or so on paying the Shoichet, they'll pay the Kehila, what actually goes on today in, in Kashris. You'll pay the Kehila, and the Kehila will hire the Shoichet. And that's how the Kehila will have income. So the Kehila went and told the Shoichet, okay, please give me all your income. And the Shoichet said, of course, we're not giving you a penny. And they, when they got the David Bornstein, the Sochot of the Rebbe, to come to town, they said, Bichlal, now we have a, a rabbi. We're not talking to you, Bichlal, to the Kehila. They were Dayonim there of the Kehila. We're not talking to you. We have a rabbi, and we're keeping the money. Uh, since they did that, things escalated. And then they announced the Kehila with their Dayonim said, we're firing all those old Shoichtim. We're going to bring new Shoichtim who will listen to us. So we had new Shoichtim who were now working according to the Kehila and their Dayonim, and they had the old Shoichtim who were working with Rabbi Bunshin. The old Shoichtim, the Hasidim, ran to Agudas Harabonim in Poland and said, what is this they're firing us? They said, Asagat Gvul. And they got a cherem of 56 Rabbonim saying, you're not allowed to do any shchit in that town, and that shchit of anybody who is not those old shoichtim is nevela. You can't eat it. That was a, a big cherem that they, they, they made. What do you do when you have a problem in Poland with that good Rabbonim? Go to Ramosh Soloveitchik. <laughs> so they went to Ramosh Soloveitchik, and at some point they brought Ramosh Soloveitchik to the town to have a boyruz. Uh, I found this very nice description of the man describing that, that whole scene. I won't go into it. It appears in the article. The virus didn't work out, and the other side left the town, and Ramosha remained there, and he was all upset. And then the, the Rosh Akol there describes how Ramosha starts pacing the room back and forth, back and forth the whole day thinking. And he said, I'm going to write you a heter. And then it's very brisk the way he, he describes it there. It's very interesting. He says he... They brought in a, a, a sofer to write down the tshuva, and he read to him the tshuva, and he wrote it in a nice uh, handwriting. And then he tells Ramosha Solovich, he tells the Rosh Hakol, okay, read the, what I wrote. And he reads, now explain to me what I said. Because Ramosha Solovich wants to see that it will be absolutely clear to those who are reading what he means. So he's practicing on the Rosh Hakol, and he makes sure, and he describes how he's sitting there, makes sure that the soifer who's copying is not changing one letter that it should be exactly like he wrote it. And then he goes and publishes again in the major newspapers, a hetter that is 56 Rabboni Madroim, a very serious topic, there, Now in Botel of Vuto, it's Amiratis, what it says there. <laughs> and that sets up an uproar, which is unbelievable. They have also newspaper articles attacking him, and also Chuvis Alocha, <coughs> who are attacking what he's saying. What is he basically saying in that, uh, uh, in that, in the, that letter and two responses that he, he prints afterwards? There is no such thing as setting up any Isur or Heter since the end of the Sanhedrin. Of course, it's all based on Rambam, and the Rambam, uh, Sanhedrin, Berishka Sagozi, Zeik al Toiro, they can do uh, Takanot, and they can do Gzerot, and they can do Knasot, and they can Lefaresh uh, Torah, and when they decide, that is Torah. And that is an Isur and a chidush with their abonon, you have to, everybody has to know the whatever the Sanhedrin does. But once you don't have Sanhedrin, nobody has the power anymore to make up a, a gzeir, or a cherem, or isur. Problem is, and that's what they start publishing on the other side, you've had over generations, hundreds of rabbonim putting together and saying what sounds like an isur and doing something or some takona. Even cherem der Rabbeinu Gershom. So how do you explain that if you say it has no power? So that's what you should know. Once you don't have based in, it all depends on what the people do. If the people accept it, and they're all noyeg in a certain way, if you're not going to be noyeg, what everybody is noyeg, and that is a very serious thing. So since the tzibur is doing it, you have to do it. But as long as the tzibur doesn't do it just because they said, you don't have to do it. That sounded terrible. Rabbi Trunk uh, put out a tshuva attacking him very, very uh, seriously. And among them, he says, he brings cases, for example, that if somebody is shoichet, specifically, he says, Shulchan Aruch, if somebody is shoichet against or ra'ah, where the kahal decided that he's not supposed to lishchot, his shchita is a suha. <coughs> Ramoshin's response says, no. That's again a different thing. Once everybody is knowing according to the takona, 
Now it has a din shavya nafshe chaticha de isur. There is such a din that a person could say, for me, I consider this piece of meat osur. Once he says that, for him, it is not allowed to eat that meat. So once the kahal is all accepting of this takona, then it's already an isur. So there's as if two levels. There's first a question, these rabbi make a takona. Ramosha is saying it has no effect halachically. There's a second stage when the kahal accepts it. Now, the tzibur is knowing that, so you have to do what everybody's doing. And then there's a third stage if the person himself already started to, to do makpid on that, it's already for him. You're not allowed to change that, that anoga afterwards. Um, there is much more to say about that, but as uh, Reboch uh, gave it to Professor Rakov, he told me your, your, your heading is misleading. It's not just talking about Machoikas, but this is true. We have questions here about Lotasig uh, Vulrecha. We have the questions of about. Uh, how you make takonos and xeris and isurim, very, very uh, uh, basic questions that Ramosha is talking there. Ramosha says also there is no, no such thing as a asagat gvul. That he calls as amaratzis. Asagat gvul in the Torah is talking about moving the borderline, what happens here now. No, for example, somebody builds, every time he builds, they try to steal another 20, 30 centimeters from the neighbor, right? They make the wall a little bit further. That's a sagat gvul. It says specifically in the Torah. Nothing else is a sagat gvul. Again, everybody tells them, what do you mean? We have hundreds of askomas to books where the, where the Rabbonim say it's a sagat gvul if somebody will come and uh, publish a new book. He says, well, they use it for the wording, but of course they all know that doesn't really mean that there's an issue. Uh, a big question in itself. Okay, uh, uh, I'll stop this uh, uh, at this point and try, try to go to several conclusions. What happens is actually, so at this time, Ramosh Zolovechik, he's had battles with Agudas Israel, he has had battles with Agudas Harabonim in Poland. He himself has gone out against all these people and he's not really in the Mizrahi. I don't see him appear at any other convention and definitely towards the end of his time in Poland he's Separated for them. He's all alone against the world. <laughs> but he's all alone, and every time he says it, he's trying to say what he believes is the absolute truth. He's, it's not a fight with him. None of these battles were against him. He didn't have to interfere. He believed this is the truth, and this is a distortion of the truth, and he goes out with the Ebes, even though the consequences for him personally might be very bad. He doesn't care, and he's publicly publicizing, pu- uh, publishing them. Now, uh, if I'll jump again, uh, this, uh, this Sassoon who put out this response article, he writes at the end that five years ago, he already found this material, and he was going to write an article, and he started or wrote an article in English about Ramoy Soloveitchik, and then he went to some grandchildren of Ramoy some of them living here in the neighborhood, I think, and they told him, it won't la harboiz kvoy toiro to publish it. And the other one told him, kashem shkibal tesocha ala prisha, tchabel sacha ala prisha, and he goines his article. But now, since I'm already <laughs> so he can already add his parts up. Now, why do I not really trouble with that? Because, first of all, Ramosha himself, as I mentioned, it's not that he said this in some private conversation. Ramosha decided to publish this in the national newspaper time after time after time. He thought it was important that 100,000 people should know this opinion. Now, you may not agree with him, but Ramosha himself thinks that's true. So I don't think... Anybody should come and say the Ramosha, well, we know it's better for Ramosha not to publish it. He thought it was supposed to be published, and it's never been mentioned, ever, you know, in any of his Ksofim, definitely, but nowhere else. All these things that he published would have beautifully written in beautiful Hebrew, beautiful, clear, brisk way of thought, analyzing. They're, they're really beautiful uh, shtickles of Torah, the Ramosha, and they're never published because uh, we want to. Some people don't want to have the part that he's saying against the central authority, and some people want him to be more mainstream and accepted, so they don't want to mention it, but I think to be true to Ramosha is, is to mention those things, but it's not only that, I think it's, uh, it's still relevant to today, well, maybe even more relevant today than uh, it was uh, when he wrote them, uh, because the question of a central authority uh, of Rabonim, or, or the power of Rabonim to make an issue or not, is is one of the major issues that we're discussing today. And as I mentioned in the article, his brother in Yerushalayim, his younger brother, more extreme brother, the Briskerover, actually was fighting against the Mizrahi and all kinds of initiatives of the chief rabbi in Yerushalayim who were exactly the same kind of battles. 
At some point, there was an idea to start a Sanhedrin. There was an idea of, they had a national convention of world rabbis, and the Briskerov was fighting against that, and he's using almost exactly the same terminology that Ramoisha is using against the Gudas Israel, he's using against the Mizrahi. Both of them coming from what they learned from their father, that this central authority is a terrible thing. Uh, so, you know, nowadays when you attack from the right, let's say, that's fine, nobody disassociates themselves with somebody attacking from the right, but when you're using the same claims to attack, I don't know if to call it from the left, but to say, uh, sitting in the Mizrahi and saying that I think the, the Moisik Dara Torah Akud is a problematic based on the Briskader, that has dissipated and it had uh, basically zero effect. Um, it's a very interesting question there that he's discussing. And, and even they themselves in Aguda have a lot of discussion. That should be an article on themselves. What is Moisik Dara Torah? If Moisik Dara Torah is coming to be the central body to determine what is Aloha, what is Jewish Ashkofa, it can't be related to a party. If the Marcheshet that we mentioned, Rabbi Egez, Rabbi Chaim Moises, best friend in Vilna, is in the Mizrahi, that doesn't mean that his opinion in Aloha, he, he shouldn't be sitting there. And if uh, that more, the Mukhacha Rebbe, the Belzer Rebbe, who are extreme from the other side against Aguda, that means that they're not part of Moetzik Dora Torah. So there were people in Aguda who said, we should, we should allow in the Moetzik Dora Torah people from outside, but they never did. So the other way of looking at it is, well, we're not deciding what Aloha is for everybody. We're saying how, to, how, to, how this party should act. It has a top rabbinic authority who's telling them how to act. If that is so, that may be okay, but that means that it has no standing halachically outside the Agudah and definitely they don't look at that. And, and you see those discussions among them also, and Ramosha is really bringing it extremely to fore. Um, now, about the thing that he was attacked in one of those newspaper articles that I mentioned before. Why does it so trouble you, Ramosha? We have this great fight about religion. Why are you worried about uh, Moise of the Torah? This is not clear from what he says, but what I believe is his outview on the subject is he doesn't view himself as uh, Esha Torah. He's not in charge of Kiruv, and he's not in charge of general humanity. He's in charge, as briskers, keeping the Torah rain, halocha clean, it should not be corrupted. Our section, our Daladam Torah should be clean. And this, in my view, or what I believe is from my father, is not true Torah, not true Aloha, and then I'm going to fight, even if the consequences are bad. Okay, I'll just uh, take it to the end of his story, since it is part of his story. He got, of course, into a fight with the, uh, with the seminary, rabbinic seminary, because it wasn't according to what he said. And when the, they finished learning their four years, they told him, okay, all the 20 guys in this class should get smicha. And he said, no way, smicha doesn't, is not based on learning, I'm going to test them. And he tested them, and two guys can get smicha. They told him, but we promised them smicha as part of the deal. He said, it doesn't based on how many years you are in high school to get smicha, you have to know. And they had a fight, and they had other fights there, and he left, because he was true to his word. Um, and at that time, in YU, uh, there was a Rosh Hashiva there, again a Talmud of Chaim, a tremendous genius, Rav Shloimer Polyachik, the Mechite Ilui, uh, who had also being a Rosh Hashiva and leader in a yeshiva that had high uh, general education uh, before he was in YU. He was in YU. He died at a young age in 1939, about, uh, 1929. And uh, they offered Rav Moshe the position in YU. His, his family was definitely happy to take it. Uh, he first went there, and half a year later they came, and he became a Rosh Hashiva in YU, and he was there for about 10 years, uh, 11 years until he died in, in 1941 at a young age, relatively, of 62. Um, I dis didn't discuss the, the U.S. part of his, I, but I did mention that I think that's more or less where he came to Menucho Vedachalo. He was very well respected in the United States. He had good connections both with the Mizrahi, both with the Aguda Sarabonim there, and with the Aguda. Uh, he had Talmidim, he was teaching Torah, which is what he really wanted to. Uh, and uh, ironically, in his last year of his life, they had the first convention of Aguda in the United States, and he was appointed to Moetzis Doyla Torah. Together with his son, Rabbi Shabir. Now, uh, I don't know how, how, how he accepted that. I, uh, there was somebody, uh, uh, Pick, maybe you know him, I think he has, uh, from Bar Ilan. Yes, he, in one of his articles, he says, well, that was, he was against that, that was Bidin Zochim, they appointed him, but he never agreed to be in that. How do you be assured that he suddenly agrees to be? As I mentioned there at the end of the article, it's not a good enough answer. It's true he wasn't there, but his son was there, and he accepted it, and then he was in another convention, and 
there, there must be some other explanation why he thinks that Moetzik Dura Torah of, of uh, Atzot Abrit is different than the general Moetzik Dura Torah Aguda, uh, that it's just the Harvest Torah and so on. Uh, and the eulogy for Chaim Moiser, who died in that first convention, was given by his son, Rabbi Soloveitchik, to be Masbid with Chaim Moiser, the one who he had this battle with. So there's a, there is some uh, kind of closure there, and because of his untimely death, his son became Rosh Hashim Wayu, and uh, definitely the rest is history. Uh, so I still think there's a lot to be said about Rabbi Moiser Soloveitchik and this, this story of... Um, coming from this place and continuing, in his view, all the time, continuing his father's derek of learning, taking it to uh, somehow uh, totally different areas, um, while being true to himself and paying publicly, at some point at least, a serious uh, uh, price, personal price, is being true to his derek. I think there's still a lot more that can be said and, and learned about uh, Moshe Soloveitchik and his, and, and his ways and his and in the story.